I wanted to jump in with a question um, that we didn't get to the other day, uh, Evelyn. I uh, would like to know how to deal with limited receptive language. And, and we, we talk on the show all the time about receptive and expressive language, but maybe you want to start and give everybody a refresher course so that, because I used to always confuse these two. I'd be in an IEP and they would say this and I would go, somebody just stick a, a, a railroad spike in my head. Which one is which again, uh, right? Took me years before I would go, oh, okay, I know what receptive language is. So go ahead, Evelyn. I think depending on the child of your age, you shouldn't worry so much about, uh, it, it just varies according to what level you're of understanding. But essentially receptive language is the language that you hear. Someone gives instructions, and I'm following them, that means that I understand receptively what someone else is saying. So if a child demonstrates like um, an inability or inconsistent responses, you, a lot of times the first thing to rule out is the non-compliant aspect, is a lot of times when we give instructions to kids, it's not for pre preferred activity. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's not so preferred, and even now, if my kids come to me and say, hey, you know, I, I, I need food or something like that, and I know they can do it, I, my receptive language may not be so good. <laughs> and, I, and that's more of a part of noncompliance. So you have to test this out first. If you are offering, if you start giving them or talking to them or putting instructions about all their favorite things and they're able to respond, but when you're telling them to come here, put on their shoes, hurry up and get in the car, um, go to the bath, which they hate, and they're not doing it, it, there's a fine line between what is them just choosing not to do it and them not understanding what it means. So if you're talking about receptive language understanding, um, there, are, there are a group of kids that have auditory processing issues, which means they hear correctly, but maybe as the way the words process through their brain, it processes a different way. And we've seen it in many of our kids where parents will come in and say, wow, the tree cutter is like, you know, four blocks away and we can't hear it. But our kid immediately, you know, starts to stop what they're doing and seems very distracted. And then after, if we wait a few minutes, um, the sound of the car or whatever it is coming down the street, we hear it. And then when the car is gone, the kid's back again. So, they, so there are kids that we have, I think, that I think they hear. She froze. A frequency that is different from the other. <laughs> and um, so there is that aspect, but I think that's the same with speech. We have many kids where we have speech therapists will give them auditory processing tests, assessments. And we realize, oh, wow, they hear all the sounds except for the glottal stop sounds. So they don't hear the, the Gs, the Gs, the, the sounds made back here. Or maybe they, they hear all the sounds except for the voiceless sounds, the P and the H. They don't hear. So just think about what language sounds like if you're missing certain sounds in terms of processing. And maybe they're not even missing them, but maybe it's just delayed the processing. Thank you for saying that, because that's a very, and you know, it's kind of like when you're on Zoom and when things <laughs> stick and you're trying to piece it together and like sometimes you can do it and sometimes you lose the gist of it. And, and I, you know, it's, it's, I, I find it interesting, Evelyn, that you started talking about um, like, be sure it's not a non-compliance thing because I have selective hearing too. There are things that when I don't want to hear it, I don't attend to it, right? Um, but I will say that in the classroom, I'm often so disheartened by the fact that teachers assume that if they give an, like a direction to a child and they don't immediately respond, they, they infer from that 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 is non-compliance. And often it's exactly what you're saying right now, that they're on a little bit of a delay or that, or that they cannot hear the sounds that are being said and decipher them with any speed at all. And then, then somebody goes on to the next direction and they haven't been able to decipher what the first instruction is. And they tune out at a certain point because they're like, I'm not getting it. It's like me at a conference where they're using jargon. Uh, I'll try to hang. And when they get to like eight jargon words in a sentence, I go, I'm gonna bake mental cookies. Um, and our kids do too. So thank you for bringing that up. I'm, and I'm sorry, I interrupted you, go right ahead. 
No, but see, there's just so many considerations before jumping to there's something wrong with their receptive language that they don't okay. have. There's just a lot of assumptions. And there are some kids who receptively, it is one of the hardest things to teach. Um, and these kids don't have typical development. We've had kids who talk before they hear. And how does that work? <laughs> Yeah. But it happens in typical development that does not happen. You hear first, then you do, you know, you're able to do. But I have to say that there are, um, it's a small group, but it's common enough where I say there's a group where there are some kids who completely talk with no problem, but they, the receptive end, there is something that the understanding isn't there when we're teaching it. But that said, many of our kids also have really strong visual memory. And a lot of our kids, actually all of us, we all tend more towards is visual memory better or auditory memory better? When we, some people have to close their eyes and hear something before. Before they understand. And some people have to like plug their ears and understand. And our kids are exactly the same way. But what I've seen is a lot of times when kids do have some receptive language delay, they start depending on their visual memory a lot more. And I don't know if it's a coincidence or if it's how their brain made or just consequence, I have no idea. But there are a whole group of our kids who the minute they see something, they know all about it. And those are the kids who are the visual learners. Those are the kids who a lot of times love the alphabet, can read, have hyperlexia, which is um, learning to read before anyone's taught them to read. You know, they can see it in a sight word, they can see the word and memorize it right away and know that that word is cookie you know, because that's their favorite word <laughs> or their favorite food. And they're two years old and no one's ever taught them. But, um, you know, the first parent that had hyper, that had a kid with hyperlexia, the first kid that I worked with was mom um, had Sesame Street on TV and had turned down the volume because she was on the phone and her kid was nonverbal and was sitting there reading all the words as they flashed, <laughs> fall, jump. Like he just knew all the words and she was like freaking out completely because her child had never said one word before. But in this circumstance, he was a visual learner and, and he had some auditory processing delays that we realized later, but that visual memory just kind of took over everything. So when he was learning language, we always gave a textual prompt for everything because it just went a lot faster as his receptive language was developing and getting better and he was learning how to process information that was coming in auditorily. So, you know, don't jump to those delays. A lot of times, um, if your child does have some type of auditory delay, that we have been able to find ways to compensate. But that, you know, and, and in a school setting, what that would mean is instructions always have to be written down for your child. It's not gonna be just depending on, you know, the teacher giving that um, vocal instruction in front of everybody for them to know. Because maybe your child, if there was a day delay, they missed it. But in your IEP, there should be this accommodation that all their work has to have this component of textual um, visual information being given to them so that they're not falling behind. So if you don't know what it is, at this point in time, all you see is that your child's receptive language doesn't seem to be it sounds like you got to lean into your experts a little bit, that you got to talk to your BCBA, see what they're noticing, perhaps talk to the pediatrician uh, to see what they're doing. But it sounds like too, Evelyn, that um, I, I love the phonemic awareness um, part of skills, uh, which is in the academic curriculum. It sounds like that might be something worthwhile to look at if your child is, is not demonstrating uh, receptive. Am I, am I barking up a wrong tree here? Well, it's good if it, it, I think it helps the, the person that's not, doesn't know, hasn't been educated in all this, organize it. Because the phonemic awareness breaks it down into all the different sounds and you can kind of follow just to check. Yeah. Yeah. And for people who don't know, so that skills for one of the autism. First things, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, one stuck. of the first things I talk to parents about is when you're talking, use short words, phrases. Don't talk too much. Your child's learning a language. And if you talk too much and I'm, you put me somewhere and you're talking another language, I tune out. It's like what you were saying. But if you start to shorten your language to phrases or just to one word, and you'll see a lot of times the kids start to perk because suddenly they realize, oh, I know what that means. You said that word, I've heard that word before. And sometimes just shortening 
um, how you talk to your child. And it, sound, it might sound rude from the outside, but for your child, that might be the beginning of just like slowing down your language, um, speaking in short sentences and short words, phrases. We teach our families that a lot right at the beginning of when they start ABA. And you, it, it, it's a big difference. You know, they, it's just that the bunch of, when you don't know what sounds mean and there's a lot of sounds, you just tune out. So if you can shorten the amount of sound and noise that's coming in, a lot of times suddenly the kids start to be more receptively aware. Wonderful. Thanks for watching Autism Live. To subscribe, click here. And if you'd like to check out some more of our videos, click here.